you in the, the half hour. Um, so let's start with a simple example of search, right? So we've got an array of integers and we've got a query. We need to find it in the array. So we can just do binary search, start in the middle and, and there we go and, and we find the element. Okay. Um, an alternative, if we have a prediction, is start with the predicted place and then use sort of a, a doubling binary search, like one to the left, then two to the left, then four to the left, until we find an interval where it appears. And then we can use sort of a, a binary search once we find the actual interval that the element appears in. But the idea is to use a prediction to help start us on our search. All right, so binary search is order log n. And what you can see, or it's a, a pretty simple analysis, this prediction-based search is order log of whatever your prediction error is, right? And here I'm not counting whatever time there was to do the prediction, I'm just talking about the search, the searches order log prediction error steps. Um, we'll use the term robust, generally speaking, to say that it still behaves nicely in the worst case, right? So even in the worst case, the search is also order log n, you're, you're only gonna lose maybe a, a constant factor, a factor generally of two. Um, uh, and this other property that we might call consistent. In the best case, the prediction-based search is, is as good as it can be. It's constant time. All right, so this is just a very simple example to show that you know, if we have good machine learning, this can improve traditional algorithms. And again, this is, this is not surprising. You can think of this even perhaps as a variation on, an, on the long known interpolation search. But here we sort of put a machine learning type uh, framework on it. And, and it's, it's meant to be an example to show where or how machine learning could possibly improve traditional algorithms. All right, so now let me look at a, another example scheduling. So suppose we have two types of jobs, short jobs and long jobs. Uh, natural goal is to minimize the total waiting time or the expected waiting time per person. So if you didn't know anything about the jobs, right, the natural thing you would do, depending on what your notion of fairness might be, might be first come, first serve, right? I'll, I'll handle people in the, or jobs in the order in which they come in. Or you might say, if you, you had all the jobs in, you know, waiting, you might say, well, I'll randomize the job order. But of course, if you know the job sizes, the sort of, uh, you know, algorithms, first year algorithms class exercise is to, to prove that the best thing to do is to just put the short jobs first. And this minimizes the total waiting time um, because you get the, the short jobs out of the way. All right, so now suppose we had a machine learning algorithm that would simply predict for us whether jobs were short or long. And then we would actually say, well, I, I don't know if things are short or long, but I might as well use this predictor, right? And so then you can ask questions like, well, if there's classification error, and you know, for me, um, working in probability as I do, I like simple models where short jobs are misclassified with some probability and, and long jobs are misclassified with some probability. You know, what can you gain from using the learning algorithm over you know, just doing nothing, uh, assuming things come in in either a random order or, or a worst case order? Um, because you know, the, the computer science community loves price of type statements, I, I've referred to this as a, a price of misprediction. Um, so you know, think of it as a, as a yet another variation on the competitive ratio. Um, so what is the worst case ratio of the expected total waiting time using this machine learning algorithm compared to having the actual perfect information? So the idea is we have some algorithm, right? I'm not necessarily even saying it's an optimal algorithm, but even just for any algorithm, you can say, well, what's the cost compared to having this imperfect information compared to, to what we would have for perfect information? And here, you know, you can get a result that says that this depends very nicely in, in sort of a linear fashion on the total error P plus Q. All right, so takeaways as we go forward, this was a pretty simple or, or simplistic model, but to me it highlights that, you know, bad predictions can, can actually be, you know, pretty helpful, um, right? So if we just considered like a random order, for instance, the sort of do nothing, that would be P and Q are both a half, right? And if you do instead like, well, 
maybe I have a bad predictor. It's only right, you know, 40, per, it's only right 60% of the time and it's wrong 40% of the time. Well, that's still good. It still gives you an advantage. It's still doing something for you in, in a, a non-trivial amount, right? So, um, you know, even bad predictions can, can potentially be helpful. Um, and in particular that we can really treat these problems mathematically. All right, so now, um, of course, just scheduling, you know, short or long jobs isn't necessarily interesting. Uh, long ago in what seems like previous lifetimes, I used to study like queues um, with queuing theory models. And this seemed like a, a good place to come back to when considering machine learning. So this is something I've looked at. Um, you know, so to start, just a reminder of standard queuing models you usually assume the arrival process is Poisson arrivals, which just means exponentially distributed service times, which just means that you know, the arrival process is memoryless um, uh, as a way to think about it. Um, for service times, if you're trying to write down equations, it's often nice to imagine exponential service times, um, but in practice, you usually see more of a heavy tail distribution. And of course, what we were saying before is in, in simple models, you don't actually know the service times, which would explain why you would use a, a service discipline like first come, first serve. But of course, if you knew the service times, you'd, you'd do something different or better. Um, and in some systems, you might have preemption. In some systems, you, you might not have preemption. All right, so the main sort of result is that from original queuing theory for standard queues, MM1 queues, that's Poisson arrivals, exponential, exponentially distributed service times. The M stand for memoryless. If you do a first in, first out, your arrivals are, should be, you know, the arrival rate should be less than the, the time per service. Um, we can scale the service times to have mean one. Then the sort of basic fundamental result of queuing theory is the expected time in the system you know, grows like one over one minus lambda. So as lambda gets close to one, this asymptote, asymptote of the one minus lambda really starts to, to hit you hard. If you know the service times, of course you can do better, right? So there are variations. There's their shortest job first, which is you know, not preemptive. It's just whenever you're going to take a job, you take the shortest job you have in the system. Shortest remaining processing time is a preemptive. So you, know, you when it, um, if a new job comes in, it may preempt based on the remaining processing time left. Um, preemptive shortest job first is shortest job first, but with preemption. So you're always basing it on the actual time, not the remaining processing time, um, but, but you can still have preemption for this. And all of these are known to have formula. You know, the queuing theorists have figured out these models in the, the case where there's Poisson arrivals and for general service time distributions. Um, so now you can go back and say, well, what if we had something that didn't give us the actual service times, but just predictions? So we have corresponding policies of predicted job first, predicted remaining service time, right? Pre preemptive shortest predicted job first. Um, I, I looked at a, a pretty straightforward model or simple model where we think of having a, the service distribution is given by a two dimensional density function. So that gives you both the true service time and the predicted service time. So you can think of, instead of just thinking of the service times as being governed by a distribution, both the, the service and predicted service times are given by, by a joint distribution. Um, so it turns out that you know you can go back in through the system and I'm not gonna go through the math here or def define all the terms, but that's in, in sort of the paper I, I have on this. Um, you can get a, a pretty simple formula for the price of misprediction for the shortest predicted job first, where you know some of these quantities, the primed versions or the Y versions are for the predicted times and the X or the, the, the unprimed versions are for the regular service times. And it turns out you can perform these same sort of derivations for, for these other sorts of systems as well. Um, and then, you know, you can look at some examples. So uh, a very simple example, let's say the service times are taken to be exponentially distributed with mean one. And then the predicted service time is itself an exponential random variable, but its mean is the true mean of whatever, whatever the job is. 
Um, it's just a toy example, but it's a toy example that turns out to be sort of mathematically nice to look at um, because of all those exponentials. And you know you can derive the equations that say how it should behave. The equations and simulations nicely match. And and the key takeaways are, are you get you know big improvements over not using any information, particularly when you're doing high loads, right? So uh, you know you can again the the left the SRPT is to the shortest remaining processing time. The PRPT is with the predictions, using predictions instead. And it's like, sure, you pay a price for using predictions, but you do a lot better than, than doing nothing at all. Um, and this is a, a natural sort of thing that we see across situations. Um, some of the high level messages from this work, preemption is good, but, but people know that. Uh, even weak predictions do well. Um, and the idea of why do weak predictions do well is because really, you know, we don't actually care in this setting about the predictions themselves being right. We just want the ordering of the jobs to be right. So you don't even particularly need great predictions. You need, you know, consistent predictions or consistent with the, the actual ordering. Um, and these systems can be analyzed. Um, I've done some, some further work since then I, I, on this sort of model. I, I've looked at what I call weak predictions. Like what if you really only get a, a single bit hint um, you know, so essentially you just get a, a hint, is this job short or long for some threshold you can set if you like for your learning algorithm. If it's below the threshold, you'd like it to say it's short. If it's above, you'd like it to say it's long. For a queue, you can think of this as answering the question, okay, a new job has come in. I can either put it in the front or in the back. You know, what should I do? Should I put it in the front or in the back? I think this is actually a pretty natural model for queuing type scheduling. Um, it may be an easier prediction problem, just putting things in the front or the back and then forgetting about the predictions entirely. Um, seems like it'd be easier to implement, maybe useful in situations where you have limited communication. And again, you can see sort of like results where, where you have, uh, you know, preemptive versions where you preempt the job up front or, or don't pre preempt the job up front. Um, again, the, the high level takeaways are again under, under high loads, um, you get significant gains, even with very little information from your prediction. Um, the gains I think are, are worthwhile and significant and are you know, generally closer to the optimal, you know, or, you know, or the optimal shortest remaining processing time or here with predictions, shortest predicted remaining processing time than you might expect. And I have some other you know, results, uh, both analysis and, and uh, simulations for more heavy tail distributions. And it, you actually see like for heavy tail distributions, heavy tail distributions tend to do really bad in first in first out because a long job blocks the system more frequently. And so for these sorts of things, you get even better. All right. Uh, and apologize for speeding through, but let me talk about some other things. Um, some of the original work in this area came in from caching, right? You look at the standard online version of caching, you have a cache of size K, elements arrive if you, you pay, if when an element arrive, it's not in your cache. And if it's element isn't in the cache, you know, you can put it in the cache if you, if you want to, right? So Bellady's rule gives you the opline optimal so if you knew the future, you could do you know, great things. Um, of course, we don't know the future, but maybe we can come up with some prediction of the future. All right, so this was work by Lukaris and Vasilvitsky from a couple of years ago now. So for every arrival, they try and predict the next time it will appear. So this seems like a pretty natural model. You're just doing one prediction each time set. They consider the absolute error. And again, their goals here are these terms we've used before of consistency and robustness. So consistent is like when the error is zero or, or, or close to zero, the competitive ratio should be, be very small. And yet at the same time, it should be robust, right? So it's both a nice function of the error. And if the error is bad, it, it eventually behaves like you know, not too much worse than, than just a regular online algorithm that doesn't use the predictions. Um, so the first thing you might guess to do is just follow the predictions, evict the element that appears farthest in the future. 
Um, it turns out this does very badly. Uh, this can be seen if you look at sort of a repeating sequence, um, where if you have like a single misprediction for A that causes you to keep it in the cache and then you revolve around two items B and C, you'll just keep kicking B and C out after each other, right? If, if you know you, you somehow thought A is still coming, you need to sort of update your belief somehow at some point and, and kick A out to get a good competitive ratio. All right, so what they did is they looked at a, a version of the marker algorithm that used uh, predictions. And I won't get into the, the details of that algorithm, but they had a, a number of results about this predictive marker algorithm. And in particular, you know, they, they had the sort of hybrid algorithm that said, look, if the algorithm you know, looks like it's behaving badly, at some point we can just switch back to the marker algorithm and do that in a way that, that maintains roughly the competitive ratio of the marker algorithm, um, but will do better if the predictions are better. Um, and since then, there, there's been continued work on the caching problem um, with improved ca competitive ratios and, and some simpler algorithms by, by uh, Rohaki and Wei. Um, and in this setting of online algorithms, we're seeing more and more papers um, covering this type of prediction model. So I've seen recently papers on secretary problems, online matching, page migration. I think more on the way, if you look at AAAI, ICLR, NeurIPS, um, you'll, you'll be seeing more and more of these papers, I think. So again, online algorithms are a, a pretty natural place to use these sort of learning augmented algorithms, these algorithms with predictions. There are some formal notions of consistency and robustness that help us frame what our goals are or what we're looking for. Um, other online problems have been, sort of been studying in this framework, but, but there's still certainly plenty more to do. All right, my next quick topic is, um, has to do with streaming algorithms. So things like frequency estimation, which is a, a standard sort of put on your switch or, or network device uh, tool that you would want to have is to get frequency estimations of things going by. Um, the well-known sketches for this are, are count min and the count sketch. You know, they, they approximate the counts for items. You know, the, for instance, the count min sketch, you know, will hash an item. Um, there are multiple rows, it gets sort of one location in each row, ups the count in that cell. Um, and then the minimum count associated with an item is, is its approximate count. And you know, I, I, I should really like, you know, let, let Piotr come in and talk about this. But um, you know, the problem with these sorts of sketches are, are that you get collisions, right? So if you are an unfortunate low count item, um, that happens to collide with high count items in all of these cells, you're, you're going to be off in your prediction, right? And to a lesser degree, even if a bunch of low count things all, all hash together, that they may be, you know, problems in the prediction. Um, and so what they notice is says, look, if we could just remove the high count items from the beginning, we'd clearly get a lot better results all around. Like if we actually knew what the high count items were, well, we could just pull them out, assign them their own counter. That way they'd be very accurate. And you know, they'd stop messing up all the other items that have lower counts. And we get much better uh, approximations for frequency estimation. And so you know, this is what they looked at. They said, well, if we have a predictor for high count items, can we use it to decide what to remove and, and explicitly count? Right, so you know, essentially the picture on the left is what, what this looks like, an element comes in, and if you think it's gonna be a heavy item, you give it its own unique counter and say, great, I'll, I'll count this separately, I think it's heavy. And if it's not heavy, we'll, we'll throw it over to the count min sketch algorithm. And then they derive a whole bunch of cool results on the right that I, I don't have time to get into, um, but are in their paper. And further they show like that this really, really works in, in practice. Um, you know, their, their versions are you know, the, in the red, the, the ideal versions are in the green, but in particular, you can see that you get uh, roughly from these charts, you get big gains in accuracy from, from using these sort of learned models. All right, so 
the last thing I'll, I'll quickly talk about as I, I rush through is about um, learn bloom filters. So this is the way I came into this. Um, uh, you know, someone suggested that I should look at this paper by Tim Kraska and others. Um, Tim Kraska is at MIT about doing better than standard bloom filters by using learning. Um, so I came into it really skeptical and and you know sort of came out a, a believer. You know, can we? do something about learning a set and designing better bloom filters, right? So the idea is that you use machine learning to develop a predictor. Is this an element in your set or not? And you use that to enhance your bloom filter, right? So if you can get a good enough um, predictor, you, you'll do well, right? So the setup is you just think of bloom filters as a binary classification problem. Is this an element in the set? Is this not an element in the set? The elements in the set themselves, of course, can be your training set for elements in the set. You come up with a bunch of negative examples, either from chosen elements or, or random non-elements. You throw your favorite learning model at it. Um, and the idea is that the hope is you, know, you design a, a, a learning method that will give you a number which you should think of or intuitively corresponds to, like a, a probability estimate, is this in the set or not? And then you can threshold that and say, well, things that are above the threshold are in the set, things that are below aren't. Now, the problem is that if you just do this sort of prediction and threshold type scheme, um, you may get false negatives, right? There may be some things that are in the set that are predicted wrong. Um, and so, you know, you need to do, do something about that because bloom filters typically are not supposed to have false negatives. So, you know, anything that's actually a negative, you, you run through a backup filter, right? You, you sort of use the learned oracle, the learned filter as something to enhance your, your backup bloom filter. Um, so, you know, your learned oracle may cause false positives, but hopefully not too many. Um, you catch the, the false negatives with the backup filter. And the point is, is that the backup filter can be much smaller, potentially much, much smaller than your original bloom filter because it's not including every item in the set it's only including the items in the set that somehow were not correctly identified by the learned oracle, right? So the backup bloom filter would be much smaller than an original bloom filter. Uh, if your learned oracle is small, then again, you, you can get much less size um, and get similar or say, or reduce false positive rates. Um, so recently I, I and one of my students, Eric Knorr teamed up with Tim and one of his students and tried to, you know, come up with better versions of this that are called the partition learn bloom filter. The idea here is that as the score goes up, it should be a higher probability of the query being a set element. So you should need fewer bits to, you know, to for a bloom filter for higher scores. So instead of having a single threshold, you'll have multiple thresholds, each with their own bloom filter and you can tune the learn bloom filter accordingly, right? So the, the picture here looks like, you know, sort of this on the left, you have your input, you get a score, depending on the score, it then goes to a specific backup bloom filter for, you know, false negatives in that score range. And the picture on the right sort of gives the intuition that, you know, if F is the things that are in the set, G is the things that aren't in the set, Right, you can afford to use fewer bits for, for things, the ranges on the right than, than uh, on the left. All right, so I will rush through this quickly, but just sort of say we were able to cast this as an optimization problem. Um, you know, you can think of it as a, a sequence of steps. You know, uh, if you're given the partition boundaries, how do you optimize the bits? Um, it turned out that some really, you know, once you do this optimization problem, things like KL divergence and things magically show up in the results, which is kind of nice and, and told us we were, I think, on the right track. Um, then we could figure out the issue of given the number of partitions, where do you actually find the best partition boundaries based on the solution in step one? We could find, you know, how to optimize the partition boundaries using a a dynamic programming formulation, right? Um, again, just just showing some figures. Um, you know, the the left data set here is 
a synthetic data set where we made up the scores. And in particular, we made up the scores, you can see sort of on the bottom, the way we, we sort of wanted the scores to be. So, you know, for keys, the keys are, you know, centered around or the bulk of them have high scores, many fewer of them have low scores, whereas non-keys are the opposite. They're bulked up on the, the low score end, very few of them have high scores. And, you know, in the chart, we have the standard Bloom filter, some various improvements to the Learn Bloom filter, and, you know, we're able to do, you know, better than all of them because we're actually now solving the right optimization problem. And when we have key and non-key distributions, this is for a URL-based data set, you know, that, that have similar sort of key, non-key distributions as what we would hope or expect, we get very similar results. In settings where, you know, the key and non-key distributions are, are not so great, you know, again, we, we still beat the, the prior results, but naturally by not as much. There's sort of not as much to gain um, when our, our classification is less good. All right, so here the summary is predictors can also be used to enhance you know, these types of data structures as well. You know, the, the Kraska group has been working on various lines of, of uh, index data structures. I expect to see, you know, uh, when I talk about algorithms with predictions, I, I don't mean to slight the data structures, that they should be in there too. Um, just a quick, I still have a minute, so I'll probably take two, Piotr. Um, you know, again, this work doesn't really come out of, you know, nowhere. There's long been work on optimal algorithms with advice, but they've been really more focused on the idea of what is the complexity of the optimal device, right? Um, so here the flavor is different. We're, we're sort of focused on the issues of, you know, what happens if we get practical but noisy advice that we have to feed to our, our, our algorithms. Of course, like I said, this fits in by, in the, the whole general framework of beyond worst case analysis. There is a book coming out shortly on beyond worst case analysis um, that Tim has been like the editor for, Chapters by Everyone. Uh, Sergey Vosovitsky and I worked together too. You know, we had been both working on sort of uh, survey talks and things and put together a sort of a, a survey article on, on this theme that will be in the book. Um, so, you know, the, those, if you wanted to look for, for more information on this general area, um, here are a couple of, of, of links, you know, Sergey's survey, um, Piotr's course at, at MIT, there was a summer workshop um, uh, on this theme. Again, like I said, we, we have a survey article. Um, it's up on the archive, but will also appear as a book chapter. Um, so, you know, I think this is going to be a, a, a growing area. It seems to be, you know, although it's nascent, it seems to be, you know, bursting out with lots of work and in, in what papers. There's tons of questions, you know, besides just what problems are amenable to advice, you know, what things should be predicted. Can we give feedback to the ML community? Like, we'd like your predictions to be optimizing for this or to, to look like this, because that will help out our algorithm the best. And, and can you all do that? Um, so I think lots, lots of good questions uh, to consider. Um, and that's it. All right, thanks, Michael. Uh, you, you are definitely an expert in compression. I didn't, th I didn't think it's possible to compress all this material in half an hour, but you, you did it. Uh, so we are just slightly over time. So if there is a, a quick question, uh, go ahead. Uh, otherwise, we can just switch back to Gather Town, and uh, you, you can ask. Uh, uh, I don't know, M Michael. Do you plan to attend Gather Town? I, I'll go in for after this for a little bit. Uh, for sure. a little bit yeah. So, so if somebody has questions, uh, can ask Michael on Gather Town. And uh, Jesse uh, posted Gather Town uh, link on the chat. So, like we all know where it is. All right. So I, I don't see I don't see any immediate questions. So uh, uh, we have a break, and uh, see you guys in uh, Gather Town. <laughs>